Let's uh, join our hearts together in prayer. And as we pray, uh, let me just ask you to, you know, Jesus teaches us that when we pray, we're to go into our, into our closet. And just think as you're closing your eyes now that you are entering into that closet of prayer and focusing on the Lord. And right now, maybe you hurried to church and you didn't really take the time to clear your own heart and mind before the Lord. And so right now, would you just do that? If there's something that you're worried about, it, give it to the Lord. If there's a sin that needs to be confessed, would you confess it? And would you just say to the Lord, Lord, I want to hear from you today. Speak through your word. Father, thanks for the opportunity we have today to gather as as your people in these difficult times and confusion that's everywhere. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together and and be your people as as we gather around your word and by your spirit to that connects us together. Lord, thank you for uh, our friends in the Lord that we're able to uh, encourage each other and, and, and welcome each other. And thank you just for the joy that that brings. And Lord, uh, we pray for our nation. Uh, this is such a crazy time and we find ourselves just asking, what next? What next? Lord, we pray for our, our president and uh, Melania as they are both uh, battling uh, the coronavirus. And Lord, we pray for their healing. We pray for uh, the safety of our nation in these days when uh, there, there seems to be so much confusion. Lord, we, we need you to have mercy on us and to guide us through this time. And Lord, with the election coming, we trust you uh, to give us godly, good, wise leaders Lord, we don't deserve that, but Lord, would you, would you have mercy on us and give us the kind of leaders we need uh, in these days? And Lord, uh, again, thank you that we can uh, approach you through Christ and that we can even open our Bibles and, and even trust that you will speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You can have a seat. and It's good to see you today. I want to welcome uh, all of you also, and those who are joining us online, we're glad to, to have several that uh, join up with us uh, online. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the potluck and the cookout. Uh, uh, Mike taught us today about Abraham uh, offering up uh, Isaac and uh, the preparations for the, for the offering and the sacrifice. Well, we have some men out there who are, who are preparing the altar. Hopefully it won't be a burnt offering that uh, they, they prepare for us, but uh, we're looking forward uh, to that time. We'll open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and uh, last week Zach did a great job of, of reminding us here in the first part of 1 Peter 2 about who Christ is and, uh, and, and who we are in light of who Christ is. And, and so I want to pick up there because that's where Peter lingers in the, in the verses that we're going to look at today. But let's just start again as we looked at last week, verse 5, where he says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we're just going to pick up right there, and uh, with, uh, Zach, again, did a great job of, of getting us into this subject that is so important for us. And just this one, this reminder of our identity, our identity, who we are. Now, suppose that you um, are on an airplane, you sit down next to someone, or you're in a waiting room of a doctor's office, and you sit down next to someone, and they ask you, well, uh, tell me, who are you? And, uh, and after you tell them your name, then they say, well, tell me a little bit more about your life. And so you might tell them a little bit about your family or uh, where you live or where you work. Maybe you'll uh, talk about uh, who you're going to vote for for uh, the next election or 
who you're pulling for for the NBA championship. So you just exchange some conversation about that. Um, and, and typically we respond that way when we strike up a conversation with someone and we start telling them about who we are. Uh, unfortunately, it, n- it doesn't always occur to us that the most important thing about us as believers is who we are in Christ. And so that's what, what, that's what we're going to do today is we're going to just let the Word of God and the Spirit of God remind us of who we are in Christ. That's the most important thing about you. It's not the job that you hold. It's not the, uh, it, it's not the positions that you have or the, the, the possessions that you have. The most important thing about you as a believer is who you are in Christ. And that's what Peter reminds us of. So let's just go back some of this uh, Zach dealt with last week and did a great job doing that. But notice, first of all, that we are living stones in a spiritual house. That's what he says in verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. So what he's saying there is that you and I as human beings are also sort of like spiritual bricks or stones. We're not individual stones. We, we, we uh, fit together to form a spiritual house, or he has in mind here, like a temple the dwelling of God by by His Spirit. So so when you come to Christ, you come into the church, you come into the body of Christ, and you come as a part of that like a a, a living stone. Couldn't help but think about uh, my grandson who who absolutely loves uh, Legos. And every birthday and every Christmas, his parents know that they can't give him the present in advance because he'll shake it because he knows that Lego gifts rattle. They make noise. He loves it. And, uh, and, and so you think of this in terms of just Lego pieces. When you get that box of Legos, it, uh, those are not just individual pieces that just, just are, exist alone, but rather they are to fit together into whatever it is a house or a building or a figure or a spaceship or whatever, whatever it is. And Peter is reminding us that as, as believers, we are meant to fit together with un, other believers for a purpose. So we are living stones that are being built into a, uh, a spiritual house. It's the first thing he reminds us of. The next thing he reminds us of, that we are a holy and royal priesthood. And again, Zach touched on this last week when he talked about verse 5, because he says that in verse 5, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then you jump down to verse 9, and, uh, and, he, and he brings that up again. He says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. So not only are we the living stones that God puts into the building of this spiritual house, this temple. But we are also the priests who minister inside of of that temple. And so this is the role that God has for us. We are to see ourselves as, uh, as priests. It is a privilege that we get to offer, notice he says in verse 5, spiritual sacrifices. These sacrifices are our our praise, we get to offer our prayers to him. Uh, this is uh, our ministry as, as priest. And, uh, and, and so we're not the ones who have to stand at a distance. Remember in the Old Testament, there were the priests who actually had the privilege of going into the very presence of God. Where the others had to stand at a distance, the priests were able to enter in. And so we have that, that privilege as well. You know, as Baptists, though, we oftentimes talk about this, the, the, the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. And by that, he, we mean that as believers, we have the privilege of actually going into the presence of God. God can speak to us, and we can speak to Him. And we typically think about that in terms of, of, of our privilege to do that. But the most important thing about that doctrine is not the privilege, it's the responsibility that we have as priests. We serve as priests in this, 
in this uh, spiritual temple. Uh, and, and so as priests, we represent God to people in our witness. So we're, we're speaking in behalf of God to others and uh, as our witness. But also we represent the people before God. We pray for others and we bring them into the presence of God. That is our, our responsibility as uh, a royal priesthood. But he goes on to say in verse 9, he says there, at the first, of, uh, first part of verse 9, that you are a chosen people. Now that ought to just blow your mind to think that God actually wants to have a relationship with you. That you are called out and elected by him. You've been chosen by God to fulfill his purpose in the world. You know, one of the hottest TV shows for several years now has been America's Got Talent. And so there's this long process. People audition in a variety of different places around the country, and so they all get to come together at one point and perform before Howie Mandel or, and whoever the other uh, judges are at this particular time. But as they're standing there, you know, they... they, they they are enjoying the privilege of having been chosen based upon their talent because they have talent. But I'm so thankful that God, in dealing with us, does not choose us based on our talent. In fact, the Bible tells us it's just the opposite, that we have absolutely nothing to bring to the table, that he is the one who chooses us, not based upon who we are, but based upon who he is. That we're, we're chosen not because we have talent or because we've gotten everything right or that we are exceptional in any way. He loves us and in mercy and grace pours out that love upon us. We're lost and dead in our sins, but God takes the initiative and he comes to us and he chooses us for himself. It's an amazing thing. And I hope we, you, you never lose the awe of being chosen by God. But he goes on, he says in verse 9, that also you are a holy nation. Do you see that in verse 9? A holy nation. Now that word nation is uh, a little bit confusing perhaps. In, in the Bible, the word typically means an ethnic group. And, and so believers, in a sense, are a spiritual ethnic group. We see all kinds of cultural and uh, language ethnic groups uh, around us. Uh, New Mexico is a very diverse state in that regard. But as believers, we are a part of a spiritual ethnic group. We are the holy, separate, distinct nation of God. And, uh, and so that, that word nation also reminds us that there's a unity to us. I, I think about this, that uh, we, yes, we are citizens of the United States of America, and we are citizens of New Mexico and of San Miguel County in Las Vegas or wherever else you live. But there's a sense in which we are a part of a nation that has no boundaries and no borders. All over this world, there are pockets of believers just like us today. Some have, you know, because in their, in their part of the world, they're, they're already have been to church and they're getting ready to go to bed right now. But all over the world... This, this spiritual ethnic group, we get to celebrate our union as a people. And it's a wonderful thing to think beyond just our, our citizenship here in the United States that we are a part of uh, another nation, a spiritual, a holy nation. But he goes on, he says in verse 9, that we are a people belonging to God. You see that in verse 9? You, you are a people belonging to to God. Does, does, does that dawn on you? Does that just grab you to think? The Bible says that we are bought with a price through the blood of Jesus Christ and therefore we're to honor him uh, and uh, glorify him with our, with our bodies. That we belong to God. We are his unique possession. By the way, if you have an old uh, a King James Bible that you're reading from today, it may, it, it may say something like, you are a peculiar people. <laughs> I love that. Uh, because we are sometimes. But really what it means there is a people that, 
that have been purchased. That's what that word means. God has bought us at a price with the blood of his own son. We belong to him. And then next he calls us, similar to this, in verse verse 10, we are the people of God. Look at it. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. We are the people of God. Is that the way you see yourself? Is that the way you understand who you are? That, that we together are the people of God. By the way, that's why we, we make a big deal about church membership. Because we are identified in this way. And so when we are saved, put our trust in Christ and repent of our sins, we become a part of the family of God and the people of God and what the Bible calls the universal church. And, uh, and, and so this is an invisible uh, entity, if you will, the, the invisible church. But then he calls us to be a part of the visible church, these local bodies in, of believers scattered around the world. Because in this way, we are connecting with other people of God. We're the people of God. That's who we are when we come to him. But, uh, but then who are we in respect to the world? Notice he says in, uh, in verse 11 that we are aliens and strangers in this world. He says that in uh, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So this is where it gets really practical for us. This is not just theoretical out here. This is very practical about the way we live. He calls us aliens. Now, these are not the aliens that live down in Roswell uh, that came in on UFOs. No, the aliens here meaning people who uh, live in a foreign country where they have no rights as citizens. So if you travel to, uh, to India or to China or somewhere else, you're, you're a resident there, you're in a a foreign country where you have no rights. And, and that's what we're called aliens here. And also strangers. Strangers, here that word means people who are staying temporarily in a country, but it's not their permanent home. So that's exactly what we are, church. We are aliens and strangers. This world is not our home. And uh, we should not expect that we have any rights in this world except to love and to give ourselves away. And because this world is not our home, we, we, we understand that there's this war that's going on. We feel it. In the song we just sang, do you feel the world is broken? We do. And that's why we don't feel quite at home here. This world isn't our home. And so in many, in many ways, we, we are in enemy territory here. And uh, we, we have to struggle with our own sinful desires that are fed by all of the stuff and all of the junk that's in the world. And, uh, and so we, what are we to do? Do we just go along to get along? No, the Bible calls us here to fight, to abstain from sinful desires that are connected with this world and the things that war against our souls Do you understand that? That there are things in this world that war against our souls. And so that is who we are. That is our identity. And I think it's so important for us as believers to to, to see ourselves in that light, to not get caught in the trap of thinking that what's most important about us is where we live or what we do or what we own. What's most important about us is that we are the people of God. So that's our identity, who we are. But then he goes on to talk about our activity, and that is what we do, our activity, what we do. And we do what we do because we are who we are. We live this way because we, we are different. We are the people of God. Notice, first of all, that... Our activity is that we talk the talk. We talk the talk. And I get that in verse 9 when he says, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? Why? What are we supposed to be about? 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the difference that Jesus has made in our lives means the difference between night and day. Do, do we understand that light is light because God is light? That there is, there is a way of life that is light and it's based upon who God is. There's a way of life that is dark and, it's, and, and because sin uh, is dark. And God has called us out of darkness into, into his wonderful light. And I love the fact that we just we weren't groping along and somehow we found the light. Uh, that's that old Hank Williams song, I saw the light, I saw the light. Now, well, the only reason you and I saw the light is because God shined it upon us. That's the only way. He called us, and his call, as they say, is effectual. It, when he calls us, he doesn't... You know, you don't tell a dead person. You can yell at a dead person all day long to get up, and it can't because it, it's not possible. And so what God does is when he calls us, he gives us the ability to respond to himself. And so we have been called out of darkness into this light, and that should, should so overwhelm us that it moves us to say something. Notice he says to declare. That means we speak. We speak our praises to God. In our worship, we speak our praises to God and about God in our, in our witness. We are to be vocal about it. Just think about all of the things that we talk about. Does God ever enter the conversation? Of all the things that we, we have on our minds and things we want to discuss with other people, um, is, is, is the Lord's call upon our lives at the top of the list? And, uh, and, and by the way, that word uh, declare uh, really means to advertise. That's what we are doing. We are advertising the excellency, the praises of this one who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know, there's a lot of advertising going on in this election season. Anybody ready for this to be over? I'm sick of it. Uh, and uh, just every commercial on television uh, is, uh, every other one is a, is a, is a uh, advertising a political candidate and about the virtues of a candidate and the, and the awful things that the opponent is doing. And the thing is, we don't know whether they're true or not. Just because they're on television doesn't mean they're true. And so this advertising that goes on is, uh, is not legitimate. But here we are advertising the praises of the one who is true. Everything we know about him from the word of God is true. And when we declare it, we are declaring truth. So we, we talk the talk. But we have something else to back that up in terms of our activity of what we do. We talk the talk and then we walk the walk. We walk the walk. Look at verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day that he visits us. When it talks about living such good lives, I want to just remind us here that this is not something we can do on our own. He's talking here about a life of integrity He's talking here, uh, uh, I think the New American Standard says that keep your behavior excellent. And again, the only way we can do this is with the help of God's grace in our lives. But because we are who we are, we can be what he calls us to be. We can do what he calls us to do by the strength that he gives to us. And we walk this walk, notice, among the pagans uh, who, who are watching. The, uh, among the nations, people are watching us all the time. They listen to the words that we use. They watch the way we go about our business. They, they observe the way we treat other people. And uh, we live our lives before people who do not know the God that we know. 
I was reminded of this uh, a couple of years ago. I went to the hardware store not, not far from where we live, and um, I went in to buy a particular bolt. And I went to check out, and the lady there was really, really busy, and the lady said, well, I, I don't know how much that is. Can you go back and look on the, in the box and tell me how much that is? So I went back and looked, and I came back and said, I, I think it's 70, 77 cents or something like that. She said, fine. I happened to be wearing a uh, T-shirt that day that just had a, had a Christian witness on it. It says something about Christ or something. And she said, uh, she says tell me what, what that means. And I said, well, it just uh, talks, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and it tells about Jesus, and, and um, tells about my church. And she, there's a little church that's in the shopping center there with a with hardware store, and she said, oh, I know about that church. And it and, uh, wasn't the church that, that I was with at the time, but uh, so she was starting to put two and two together. And, uh, and so a uh, little bit of a connection there. So I got in the truck, and I started to back away, and I thought, wait a minute, I don't need just one of those bolts. I need like three of them. So I had to go back inside, and when I went back to the place to get it, uh, to get the extra bolt, I realized that I had told her the wrong price, that they were not 77 cents, they were like 97 cents or something like that. So I grabbed a couple of more, went to the checkout counter, there she was, and I said, I I'm sorry, I told you the wrong price. I said they were 77, they were really 97. And so I, I need to pay the, the difference. She said, what? Are you serious? She couldn't believe. She says, you must be a man of God. And I thought, no, well, I'm a believer. She said, I need you to pray for me. I said, really? Tell me your story. She said, I'm paying for uh, my past life. And as I, I, I thought about that for a moment, as this is near Santa Fe, so you don't know what that means. Does that mean she's reincarnated and she's come back, you know, she was a cow and now she's a human being or something and she's having to pay for something she did in her past life? Um, or was she really, she made some mistakes and had some bad stuff happen in her life? She felt God was punishing her. And, uh, and she said, I need you to pray for me because uh, he and I are not on speaking terms. And, you know, I uh, was able just to encourage her right there. It was a long line of people behind me, so I couldn't take a whole lot of time. But I'm just, I was just reminded of how important it is to just watch the way we live. It's that one little 20-cent difference in the price of a bolt that struck her as being unusual, that I would, I would care to make a deal about it. Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so people who are far from God are going to read our lives perhaps long before they ever read our, their Bibles, okay? And so we are to live our lives. Notice he says, before those who accuse you of doing wrong, they accuse you of doing wrong. The title of our series in 1 Peter is Suffering Well. And this reminds us that people to whom Peter were writing, was writing were people who were being persecuted, some of them in very intense ways. You remember the stories about Nero burning Rome and then blaming the Christians and, uh, and persecuting the Christians, blaming them falsely for, bur for, for burning down the city. It went all the way from that to, to just, you know, annoying kind of, of persecution where believers were considered to be pests. And so we are to live out our lives in this world that in many ways is hostile to God and hostile to the truth. And then it talks about the fact that we're, that, that, about them giving glory to God on the day He visits us. Now we're not sure exactly what He means there. What is this day in which God visits us? It may be that he's talking there about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the judgment that's going to take place at that time. And certainly that is a reality, that there is a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that, Jesus, uh, that, that Christ is Lord. So he may be talking about that. But it may be also that this wording here was used to describe 
the court system in Peter's day. It's standing in the presence of a judge. And if that is the case, then maybe what Peter is getting at here is asking the question, if being a part of the people of God, if living such a good life were a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you in a court of law? If it were illegal, if it were a crime to be the people of God, if it were a crime to live this kind of life, is there enough evidence to convict you in a court of law? And so we talk the talk. Uh, We use our lips to declare the praises of God to our unbelieving friends and neighbors and co-workers. We talk the talk, and then we walk the walk. We back up our words with our lives. We live such good lives before them that they will glorify God. They will give credit to God for what we do. And so we're called to that today, to talk the talk and walk the walk, not on our own strength, but in the strength of that the Spirit of God living in us supplies. Well, let's, let's bow our heads together. Lord, I thank you for the truth of uh, Scripture. And Lord, it's challenging to us today as we realize who we are in this world that is so dark. You called us out of that darkness into light, and you called us to live such good lives before the pagans, before a watching world, that they see the way they li- we live and they realize there's something different about us. So Lord, I pray that as we understand who we are and what we do, we can walk out of here today and into our week committed to, uh, to be different, to show the difference that Jesus has made in us. And Lord, we love you. And we offer our worship to you now. And Lord, I pray for those who um, can probably not say today that, that they belong to the people of God. They've never put their trust in Christ. I pray, Lord, that even now as we're singing, that they will just bow their head and their heart before you and confess that Jesus is Lord, surrendering their life to Jesus today, trusting in him for the gift of eternal life. And we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand and worship.